the Battle of North Cape, December the 26th, 1943. The Royal Navy's fast cruiser, HMS Belfast, goes into action against one of Nazi Germany's most powerful warships, the battlecruiser Scharnhorst, armed with a battery of 11-inch caliber guns. Fought in the dark, in the icy waters of the Arctic Ocean, this epic confrontation would be the Royal Navy's last great battle at sea. It would be a fight to the death. It's down below water level, and there's where I stay for 12 hours. I didn't want to die, basically. I'm honest about it. I didn't want to die. On June the 6th, 1944, Belfast again makes history as she fires the opening shots of the D-Day invasion. We were about to embark on the biggest military operation the world had ever known. Using archive film and color reenactment, Battle Stations goes on board HMS Belfast to reveal the inner workings of a big gun warship in World War II. For centuries, victory in a sea battle depended on a combination of big guns and heavy armor. In the days of sail, warships would pound each other to pieces at very close range with a steady barrage of cannon fire. Their massive wooden hulls were strong, but timber was no match for iron cannonballs. In the 20th century, everything changed. Wood and sailcloth were replaced by steel and steam. Cannonballs by armor-piercing shells fired from huge guns mounted in rotating turrets, giving a wide arc of destructive firepower at very long range. The battleships were fearsome weapons, but their size and weight limited their flexibility. Their chief role was to act as a deterrent, the ultimate expression of sea power. To protect Britain's vast empire, the Royal Navy relied on a large fleet of fast cruisers. They were much smaller and more agile than the great battleships, with lighter armor and smaller guns. But their speed meant that they could be deployed very quickly to remote trouble spots. But by the mid-1930s, tensions were growing closer to home in Europe as Nazi Germany began to rearm. The German Navy began building a series of big gun warships. Many of their names would go down in history. The Bismarck, the Tirpitz, and the Scharnhorst. Great Britain responded with its own shipbuilding program. In May 1936, the Admiralty ordered a new and improved cruiser to be named HMS Belfast. She carried 12 six-inch guns in four turrets, two at each end of the ship. They had a rapid rate of fire and a range of more than 14 miles. On each side of the main superstructure, there were three torpedo tubes and three smaller gun turrets, mounting the secondary armament of four-inch guns. The hull was protected by a four-inch thick belt of steel armor plating. Top speed was an impressive 32 knots, about 36 miles per hour. HMS Belfast entered service with the Royal Navy on the 5th of August, 1939. Now she needed a crew. I was full of adventure, I, I wanted to do things, and uh, the Navy seemed a good way to get in there. And also, I had a feeling that there was going to be a war. And if there was going to be a war, I wanted to decide where I was going to go, on the fence of the sea. You come to join the Navy? I have joined. Good for you. Well, it's not a bad sort of life. For her very first crew, joining the brand new cruiser HMS Belfast was a memorable experience. When you get a new car, nobody's had their hands on it. It's yours. And that was the same thing with the Belfast. It was mine. John Harrison found himself in charge of A and B six-inch gun turrets. 
It was something to be on a ship of that size, so brand new, with all these modern things. And I went along to the turrets. They were magnificent. It was a very thrilling experience to be presented with this power. I thought to myself, when you look at these turrets, there's three guns there. They're capable of firing 14 miles. I've got a powerful beast here. And those guns would soon need to be ready for action. Barely a month after HMS Belfast was commissioned, Britain was at war with Germany. The first action was at sea. Enemy sighted. This is what they've been waiting for. Action stations. Open fire. HMS Belfast immediately joined the home fleet and began patrolling British waters in search of German ships. But on November the 21st, 1939, disaster struck. Suddenly, the lights went out. A terrific thud. I thought my head had shrunk in my shoulders. There was a terrific uplift. All of the ship was bouncing. Well, you don't do that with a ship of that size. And everything went dead quiet. And the QO said, Christ, Chief, what was that? Belfast had become the first victim of a new German secret weapon, the magnetic mine. I could hear groans, creaks, shudders, proving that there was no keel left underneath A and B turrets. HMS Belfast was so badly damaged that the Navy even considered scrapping the brand new ship rather than attempting to repair her. It was finally decided that the cruiser should be saved, but major repairs would keep her out of the war for over three years. During Belfast's long refit, huge advances were made in the new science of electronics. A crucial new weapon was radar. It transmitted a powerful radio beam, which bounced off the target and back to a receiving aerial. The echo appeared on a screen, indicating the target's position and range. This electronic eye revolutionized warfare. Belfast was fitted with the latest radar equipment, linked to a highly sophisticated fire control system for the guns. Control towers mounted high on the ship located and tracked the target by radar. The information was fed to the transmitting station, seven decks below, protected deep inside the armored hull. Here, the training and elevation settings for the guns were calculated using a complex mechanical computer, the Admiralty Fire Control Table. When the calculations were complete, they were relayed electrically to the guns. When all was ready, the guns were fired remotely from the control towers. In November 1942, with her complex refit finally completed, Belfast emerged as the Navy's largest and most powerful cruiser. And this time, luck would be on her side. Belfast was about to earn her place in history. What a gigantic job confronts the Royal Navy. Shipping to be convoyed against the ever-present threat of enemy raiders. Raiders themselves to be tracked down in vast expanses of trackless ocean which present the old problem of the needle in the haystack. Early in 1943, HMS Belfast became the flagship of the 10th Cruiser Squadron, led by Vice Admiral Robert Burnett. Burnett was an aggressive commander. His determined defense of Arctic supply convoys to Russia had made him a popular figure with his men and with Britain's Prime Minister, Winston Churchill. The Prime Minister seized the opportunity to call in to see the boys. With the Premier was Admiral Burnett of the famous Great Convoy to Russia. The Arctic Convoy was important, not only materially, but politically as well. 
since the Soviet Union was holding down the bulk of the German army on the Eastern Front, uh, the Allies knew they had to, to do something to show their sign of support. But sending through the convoys of vital supplies was an extremely dangerous operation. During the early war years, German surface raiders and U-boats had taken a disastrous toll on Allied shipping. On one Russian convoy, two out of every three ships were sunk. Many were lost with all hands. Yet in spite of all the hardships, sailing this cold and unforgiving ocean could be an inspiring experience. It's the vastness of the ocean that gets you. And there are 45-foot waves. You see these great, huge green hills coming towards you. You know, and you glory in the fact that the ship goes up and over this way, and damn it. And you're dependent entirely upon yourselves. Belfast's crew of almost a thousand men was packed into a space only 613 by 69 feet. Only the senior officers had the luxury of a cabin. The rest ate, worked, and slept in the same space, known as the mess deck. You're all in the same boat, more or less, and you stuck together, and if you went ashore, you stuck together, and uh, it was one for one and one for all. You, you don't exactly like everybody, but you put up with everybody. You've got to. They're dependent on you, you're dependent on them. Boy, you better be friendly if anything happens. Their beds were simply canvas hammocks, a British naval tradition dating back to the days of sailing ships. The awkward process of getting into a hammock was the first skill every British sailor had to master. Hands on a bar a bit higher than what your hammock was slung and just swing yourself in. You had to stay across both ends to keep the hammock from folding up. Once you get into it, you get the roll of the ship and it swings you up to sleep and it's such a, a comfortable sleep too. If the ship was at sea and you were swinging to and fro, you would have to disturb the man in the hammock next to your own if you were about to get into it. Hammocks were only that much apart. The beating heart of the ship was its engine room, situated deep down below the water level and protected by the armor plating. For the engine room crew, the deafening roar of the engines and the ever-present reek of fuel oil made this one of the most uncomfortable and claustrophobic places to work on the whole ship. One of the things all personnel do when they join the engine department is to make sure they know the precise position of every valve, every means of shutting off a source of power in the dark, and with the ship sinking, possibly. Most personnel in the boiler rooms uh, didn't expect to survive if the ship was badly damaged. Up on deck, the greatest enemy was the cold. In heavy weather, the flying spray hitting the steelwork could instantly freeze into a sheet of ice, encrusting the whole ship. It turned the rolling and pitching deck into a deadly skating rink. It seized winches, sealed up doors, and jammed guns. If allowed to build up, the weight of ice could unbalance the whole ship. Deckhands spent long hours in sub-zero temperatures, hacking away the sheets of ice. Awful. That was the worst thing imaginable. but you can't really describe this excessive cold. If you hadn't worn gloves, if you touched anything metal, you lost your finger ends, your fingertips. Absolutely dreadful. There's no other word for it. If you can imagine a, a ship plowing through icy cold water in an Arctic gale, 
in the half light that existed for quite a bit of the day, with the knowledge that if you fell over the side, you'd had it. There was absolutely no hope whatsoever of rescue. The Arctic convoys were the worst possible conditions. But the greatest danger of all was the constant threat of enemy attack. Aircraft would be fought off with a mass of small caliber weapons and the ship's secondary armament of four inch guns. The shell just reached a certain point on the barrel and up would come the breech real quick. And you had to double your fist up and push it home because you'd have lost your finger ends if you pushed it flat. Made a hell of a crap, those guns. It deafened me. There was no thought of getting rid of the old shells after the gun had discharged two big brass shells. You were rolling all over the floor and treading on them and falling and... Oh, dear. A hostile ship would be engaged by Belfast's main armament. Packed inside each heavily armoured turret, a crew of 26 men manned the three six-inch calibre guns. Beneath each turret was a gigantic armoured cylinder called the barbette. It supported the 175-tonne revolving structure and protected the system of hoists which fed ammunition to the guns. At the very bottom of the ship, the magazine supplied the explosive charge, a bag of cordite that could hurl the shell some 14 miles. One deck up, the shells, each weighing 112 pounds, were loaded onto separate hoists, which delivered them to the turret, where a series of moving trays fed them to the guns. The seven-man gun crews practiced the routine of loading and firing again and again until each man could do it in his sleep. Each crew member had a single task to perform, but all had to dovetail together at exactly the right moment. Shell off the hoist and down to loading tray. Breach open. Swing shell to breach and ram home. Cordite charge off hoist, out of case and onto tray. Ram home charge, close breach and set fuse. Elevate gun to firing position. A good gun crew could do all this in less than eight seconds. Uh, the gun crews, of course, were trained to perfection. The rate of fire was quite intense. Now, you can imagine the pandemonium in there. Organised chaos sums it up. But they all knew exactly what they've got to do, where they've got to be and how they've got to do it. By the end of 1943, the Battle of the Atlantic had finally turned in favour of the Allies. As the number of Allied merchant ships safely crossing the Atlantic increased, so did the pressure on Germany's naval commander-in-chief, Grand Admiral Dönitz, to stop them. His U-boats were being hunted down and sunk in ever-increasing numbers. But he still had one lethal weapon in his arsenal, which the Allies had learned to fear. The battlecruiser Scharnhorst. Based in Norway, she was well positioned to launch a surprise attack on the Arctic convoys to Russia. And she had the firepower to single-handedly wipe out an entire fleet of ships with her 11-inch guns. The Royal Navy knew she had to be destroyed, but any attack would need careful planning and a sufficiently attractive bait 
to lure her out of safe waters. In December 1943, as a fully loaded Allied convoy of merchant ships set sail from Scotland and headed for Russia, another was returning empty. The two convoys would pass each other in the Barents Sea, between Bear Island and Norway's North Cape. Admiral Dernitz was tracking their progress and decided to attack. His weapon would be the Scharnhorst. On the evening of Christmas Day, 1943, she set sail, but British intelligence had decoded the German signals ordering her to sea. It was the break they had been waiting for. The Royal Navy began to prepare a massive counterattack. The Scharnhorst was about to sail into a trap. These are the ships taking from Britain the results of a million hours of labor in her great factories. It was sent to aid the Red Army and it was sailed by the stoutest hearted merchant seamen in the world. Every Allied supply ship that reached Russia helped to drive back the German armies in the east. On Christmas Day 1943, the Scharnhorst sets out to stop them. But while the Scharnhorst closes in on the convoys, the British Commander-in-Chief Home Fleet, Admiral Fraser, has already prepared his two-pronged plan of attack. Admiral Burnett would lead Force One, formed of his three cruisers, Belfast, Norfolk, and Sheffield. As the Scharnhorst closes in to attack the convoys, Burnett's cruisers will intercept her and drive her back into the path of Force Two, led by Admiral Fraser's own battleship, the Duke of York. At 44,000 tons, Duke of York was one of Britain's biggest and most powerful battleships, she was armed with 10 14-inch guns. But although bigger and better armed than the Scharnhorst, she was slower by about four miles per hour, a small but vital difference. In any sort of sea battle, speed is important and maneuverability is important because if you really can't get in the proper position to launch your torpedoes or fire your main batteries, then the ultimate outcome of the battle will probably not be in your favor. As he headed out into the open sea, the Scharnhorst's commander, Admiral Bay, had no idea that the British had decoded his signals or that news of Scharnhorst's departure had been relayed to Admiral Burnett on HMS Belfast. Admiral Bay was sailing straight into the trap. It would be Christmas Day. Admiral Burnett spoke on the tannoy to say there was 50-50 chance of meeting the Scharnhorst tomorrow. It had put to sea, and he wanted us all to say a few words of prayer. So that, for a start, put a fear of God into us. He apologised for not having a Christmas dinner. He said, but either late today or early tomorrow morning, we expect to bump into the Sharnals, and if there's any action, I'll lead you straight in. It felt like David and Goliath, you know. In darkness on the morning of December the 26th, Belfast's radar picks up a signal at 35,000 yards. A large vessel is heading straight towards the convoys. It is the Scharnhorst. Belfast's crew are called to action stations. Within two seconds, the Padre gave a short service. The next thing I knew is down in the port diesel compartment, down right down below water level, and there's where I stayed for 12 hours. When you go into action, it's, you close all doors and skulls, and they've got to be shut tight, because of, they've got to be water tight, because it would be danger to the whole ship if one door was left open and it got flooded. With each man at his battle station, the crew of HMS Belfast prepared to go into action. At any moment, the huge guns of the Scharnhorst could be turned on the cruisers, but her radar had failed to detect them. Under cover of darkness, they closed to 13,000 yards and opened fire. On board the Scharnhorst, Admiral Bay is caught completely off guard. 
His ship is rocked by an explosion as one of Norfolk's shells knocks out her forward radar. The Scharnhorst turns away at full speed and vanishes into the darkness. On Belfast, the radar plotters soon lose contact. It looks as if the carefully laid plans might fail after all, but Admiral Burnett is convinced that the Scharnhorst will return for another attempt at attacking the eastbound convoy. Rather than search for the Scharnhorst, he orders his cruisers to continue screening the convoy and waits. After almost two hours of nail-biting tension, his gamble pays off. Belfast again picks up the Scharnhorst on radar as she closes in once more to attack the convoy. However remote you are from the bridge, you share in the agonizing that's going on there. And you share in the excitement. At 11,000 yards, all three cruisers open fire. Good, they've started. But this time, the Scharnhorst did not turn and run. For 20 minutes, the battle raged. For the sailors stationed deep down below the waterline, the tension was almost unbearable. As the sounds of battle reverberated through the ship, they knew that if she went down, their fate would be sealed. There's three decks down below, and there's three escape hatches above, all shut tight, and uh, well, it was a bit, bit scary, really. When these armor-piercing shells came over, which were 11 inch, you could hear him hit the water and go ping right along the keel, you know. <laughs> Any minute now. <laughs> at the very bottom of the ship, Larry Fursland's lonely battle station was at the diesel generator which powered two of the six-inch gun turrets. The most worrying thing to me was, I was isolated for, for 12 hours I was down there on my own. I didn't want to die, basically. I'm honest about it. I didn't want to die. Suddenly, the engine's cooling pump failed, and it began rapidly overheating. At any second, it too would fail, knocking the turrets out of action. Luckily, there was a fire main with a fire hose all rolled up. So I eventually undone that. Just long enough it was, I got that hose, lay it out, come down the hatch, down on the deck, and up, and I put it on the bypass. Using a fire hose, Larry fed cooling water to the engine. At last, the temperature began to drop. And I gradually opened up and opened up on the valves until I got the temperature down, and I run like that for 12 hours. If that diesel generator had gone off the board, it'd have been one or two triple turrets out of action. Larry's quick thinking kept the turrets working and would later earn him a medal one of many awarded that day. During the 20-minute battle, Belfast's gunners loaded and fired hundreds of six-inch shells. The Scharnhorst continued to return fire, and Norfolk was badly damaged, losing a gun turret and nine men killed. Then, just as he seemed to be gaining the advantage, Admiral Bay decided to break off the action and retreated. Against all the odds, the three cruisers had saved the convoy. As Admiral Bay set off at full speed for the safety of his base in Norway, with Admiral Burnett's cruisers in hot pursuit, he didn't know that the battleship Duke of York with its 14-inch guns now lay almost directly in his path. The trap was about to close. As darkness fell on the afternoon of December the 26th, 1943, the German battlecruiser Scharnhorst was heading south at full speed for the safety of her base in Norway. 
Shadowing her was Admiral Burnett in his flagship, HMS Belfast. For Belfast's crew, it was a tense and nerve-wracking time. They all knew how slim their chances would be if the Scharnhorst decided to turn her massive guns against them. Late in the afternoon, the chase reached its climax as Scharnhorst was intercepted by the British battleship Duke of York. At 4.40 p.m., at a range of six miles, she opened fire. Scharnhorst turned north, away from her attacker, but soon ran into fire from the cruisers Norfolk and Belfast. The Scharnhorst swung round again and headed east in a desperate attempt to escape the two-pronged attack. The British onslaught continued. But the Scharnhorst was just too fast for her pursuers and soon began to pull away. Once again, she was slipping through the net. Then, at extreme range, one lucky shot exploded in the Scharnhorst's boiler rooms. Her speed began to drop, and the British Commander-in-Chief, Admiral Fraser, ordered his fast destroyers to close in and launch a torpedo attack. A series of devastating explosions rocked the Scharnhorst as the torpedoes found their target. Her progress slowed to a crawl. Now there would be no escape. The Scharnhorst crew would have to stand and fight. At six miles range, Belfast opened fire once more, aiming her guns by radar into the blackness. Within half an hour, the Scharnhorst had been pounded into a blazing inferno. From his battle station high up in the radar plot, George Burridge was one of the few members of Belfast's crew who actually witnessed the final moments of their enemy, the legendary Scharnhorst. We then saw the Scharnhorst completely engulfed in, in flames. A terrible sight when you think about it. And, um, yeah, very memorable. I can see it now. It's a tremendous sight when you see a ship of that size with that number of people on go down. It's uh, unbelievable, quite frankly. Now it was time for the final act in the drama, as Belfast closed in to fire a last salvo of torpedoes at the crippled Scharnhorst. At 7.45 p.m. on December the 26th, Belfast's radar plotters watched as the Scharnhorst's blip dwindled away and vanished from the screen. The message was broadcast throughout the ship. Scharnhorst has sunk. And when it was actually sunk, a smell came down the ventilation trunkings of oil fuel, one of the foulest smells in this world. And my thought was, poor devils. That's how I felt. Swimming in oil fuel. Can you imagine it? Of a crew of almost 2,000 men, only 36 survivors were pulled from the freezing waters. I thought we should have picked more survivors up. I saw a signal in the signals office shortly afterwards, and it just said, take a small sample. Well, to me, that meant leave them. For Belfast's crew, victory was tempered by an understanding of what those final moments must have been like for the German sailors. He's only a sailor, just like you. So you don't feel any hatred. Well, at least I don't believe sailors do. They're seasick, just the same. Of the Scharnhorst crew of officers and men, 36 were rescued. These are the only survivors. 
a bitter defeat and a superb victory for these men of the British Navy. It's a matter of survival. It is either they go down or you go down, because naval tradition being what it is, you, the, the ships fight until it goes down. There's no question of surrendering or, or giving in or, or turning away. You, you fight until the end. Uh, not a very clever situation, you might think, but um, that's the way the Navy does it. So we achieve what we win after. And uh, no regrets for those that got killed, of course. None at all. No, it's just another enemy ship sunk. Good oh. It wasn't me. That's the th that's the theory. It was him. Heartless? That's what we're trying for. It had been a Christmas the men of HMS Belfast would never forget. Their ship had played a key role in the first modern sea battle. A battle fought mostly in complete darkness, depending entirely on the new science of electronics. But the first was also the last, as centuries of naval tradition were swept away. The Battle of North Cape represented a really a changing of the guard as far as the Royal Navy was concerned. I mean, the Royal Navy had been built on the tradition of Nelson and Trafalgar and HMS Victory. It was uh, the big gun battle, the gunnery duel, the broadsides against the enemy. Um, yet North Cape represented really a passing of those traditions. It was the last big gun uh, engagement in which the Royal Navy was involved. Britannia ruled the waves once more. Germany had lost the war at sea. Now she had to be beaten on land. As the new year dawned, plans for the invasion of mainland Europe were already being finalized, and HMS Belfast would be at the very heart of the greatest military offensive in world history. Early 1944, at sea, the German battle fleet has been defeated. It looks as though the big gun battleships and cruisers of the Allied navies are no longer needed. But one final task remains. Their massive firepower will now play a crucial role bombarding German forces on land. By late spring of 1944, plans for the D-Day invasion of mainland Europe were in place. Warships like HMS Belfast would protect Allied troops during the critical early stages of the invasion. The first few hours of any invasion um, against a beachhead are, are pivotal because if the enemy is able to bring reinforcements up, it can really turn back the assault troops or really throw them back into the sea. German troops that may have been able to influence the uh, battle on the beaches were, were just prevented from getting there because of the big gun ships like Belfast. On the evening of June the 5th, 1944, a vast armada began crossing the English Channel to the Normandy coast. Among the leading ships was the cruiser HMS Belfast. The Admiral told us that we were about to embark on the biggest military operation the world had ever known. The success of this tremendous undertaking depended vitally upon the naval bombardment that would precede the assault of ground forces. General Eisenhower said of these men, there is no question at all as to the readiness of the troops. They are well trained, fit, and impatient to get the job started and completed. Going up the English Channel, we were actually threading through in daylight. These hundreds and hundreds of of vessels all in straight lines, and these silent soldiers. One or two sailors tried to cheer, but they soon gave it up. The soldiers were absolutely quiet, and we went on and on through these ranks until it got dark. Incredible sight. With the knowledge that these were the these were the human beings who were going to go ashore. At 5.30 a.m. on June the 6th, 1944, HMS Belfast fired the opening shots that launched the D-Day invasion. Shh. 
shattering the dawn 90 minutes before H hour, the naval bombardment opened up. Rapid firing cruisers like Belfast were the ideal weapon for coastal bombardment. With her battery of 12 heavy guns and a range of roughly 14 miles, Belfast could saturate a target and inflict enormous damage within minutes. Each gun turret could fire more than a ton of shells every 60 seconds. A broadside of all four turrets pulverized the German positions with a ton of shells every 15 seconds. My action station was the after engine room and realizing that history was being made, I gathered the stokers and the petty officers and that's the actual expression I used. History is being made up there. And I said, if you are willing to risk your lives and want to see what's going on, it's up to you, you can go up the ladder. Two minutes up the ladder and back. And every single man went up the ladder to have a look. And I waited till last and went up. And there was D-Day. Every picture I see reminds me of that two minutes looking at these hundreds of vessels and the men jumping into waves five feet high. The bodies on the beach, the confusion on the beach. Yes. We saw D-Day. German resistance remained firmly entrenched. For more than a month, Belfast continued to pound the German lines, firing thousands of shells. At last, the Allies began the breakout to the east. Within two days, the Germans had retreated beyond the range of Belfast's guns. And on July the 8th, she fired her last shot. She returned to England with her gun barrels worn out, but her task was finished. After World War II, there would be no more epic battles at sea. In the atomic age, the armored warship with its big guns soon became a relic of the past. Today, HMS Belfast is moored on the River Thames, opposite the Tower of London. She is preserved as part of Britain's Imperial War Museum, the very last survivor of the Royal Navy's big gun armored warships. They are no more. The dear old Belfast remains. And may she float alongside the jetty on the Thames for the next 50 years. I lived in Portsmouth, and uh, as a schoolboy, 
I was very much interested in everything naval. And one of the opportunities um, for a job or a profession at the school I attended was the Royal Navy. And the most attractive um, position in the Royal Navy for somebody like myself was an artificer apprentice. <clears throat> because at 15 years of age, it offered the opportunity to leave home and undertake a four and a half year apprenticeship. So in brief, the Navy from the time I was 15, clothed me, fed me, educated me, taught me a trade, and led me through four and a half years of a really, really good uh, sporting activity, because they had wonderful, wonderful um, rugger teams and football teams. Well, the, the, uh, the life in the uh, establishment itself we're very much like public school. We were part of the Navy, but different to anybody else in the Navy. In four and a half years, you create rugger teams and football teams and cricket teams that can beat the best. And uh, if you get 400 apprentices on the touchline of a rugger field, you know, all shouting in unison, and we had this peculiar war cry somebody would shout out, you know, what do you say then? And 450 voices will, hey, oh, jubilee! <laughs> <laughs> you know, and there was this public school spirit to it. That's right. Uh, at the beginning, I had only a department. The engineers divide the ship between them and one has responsibility for the engine room, another the boiler rooms, another the auxiliary machinery. So when I first joined Belfast, I had the engine rooms as my responsibility. When I became the senior engineer, I became responsible for the entire ship. And uh, that was a great Honour. Now, when the Shalnos was sunk, which it was at quarter past seven in the evening, we'd been at full speed all day. Okay, and when it was actually sunk, a smell came down the ventilation trunkings of oil fuel, one of the foulest smells in this world, and this strong smell of oil fill came down and my thought was poor devils that's how i felt swimming in oil fuel can you imagine it oh absolutely dreadful there's no other word for it if you can imagine a, a ship ploughing through icy cold water in an Arctic gale in the half light that existed for quite a bit of the day, with the knowledge that if you fell over the side you'd had it. There was absolutely no hope whatsoever of rescue. Um, yes, with the ship in the early stages, covered in messes of ice. Everybody wearing a maximum amount of clothing he could get on. You know, which in itself was a hazard. You can't swim in three overcoats or two pairs of socks. Yes, I would suggest the Arctic convoys were the worst possible conditions because it combined foul weather uh, with an awful sea and with all the dangers that came from being at sea in a war zone, subject to aircraft attack, submarine attack, 
Scharnost attack. There was only one good thing came out of the convoys, and that was written by Winston Churchill, who said in a letter to Stalin, we had good luck come from the convoys because it brought the Scharnost out to sea and we sank it. We passed three um, airmen in a um, uh, life raft, three German airmen, and we went past. They stood up and waved. And all one thought about was, well, poor devils, they're going to drown. But we couldn't stop because uh, we might have been baked for a submarine. But you, you felt sympathy for them. Poor devils. I had charge of the Stokers Division. And uh, they were ranged in three rows. Prior to the inspection, uh, we were told to choose a man in each rank who might be of interest to His Majesty. And if His Majesty paused, we were to indicate. So I chose from the, my division the stokers who had a decoration, you know, from some previous engagement. Now, these visits are timed to the second and you get a timetable that says 10 13 his majesty embarks 10 17 his majesty disembarks and the commander goes ahead and indicates whether the king is ahead of his schedule or astern of it so he indicates from afar slow him down or speed him up. So along came the king and he passed along the front rank and to my astonishment stopped in front of a stoker and said, when did you serve in the Palestine police force? I hadn't a clue this stoker had been in the Palestine police force. But for this occasion he wore a medal which the king recognised. The king passed to the second rank and I had my man already in mind to say this man was such and such. I wasn't required to do it. The king stopped in front of a stoker and said you're in the royal yacht. And uh, the stoker said yes sir I left it at such and such a date. The king passed on to the third rank, and I had in my third rank a West Indian French, Free French Force stoker. West Indian. The king stopped in front of him and addressed him in English. Now it was my duty to step forward and say, he speaks only French, sir. So the king changed over to French and spoke several sentences to this um, West African whose skin, very, very dark, glowed. And his eyeballs went absolutely bloodshot. And then the king passed on. And then to everybody's astonishment, Instead of replying to my farewell salute, he turned round, stopped, turned round and said, how does he get on with the other stokers? And I replied, very well indeed, sir. They look after him, they take him ashore. If he doesn't come up for his dinner at the proper time, they go and find him. Oh, very good indeed, he said, and then went on his way. Imagine, this is the king showing an interest 
Him a black man. Fantastic. The king knew all about D-Day, but he had spared time for a West African stoker. Part of this. It happened, what, 60 years ago, and looking forward 60 years, I can't see it happening again. Where are the 15-inch guns to come from? I doubt if there are any, except in museums or some hidey hole somewhere. Our ships have all been melted down of that size. Think. I served in Nelson, victorious. They are no more. They've been turned into spoons or forks or something. <laughs> the dear old Belfast remains. And may she float alongside the jetty on the Thames for the next 50 years.